Hello once again everyone, I'm your host Ray Shasho. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency specializing in authors and musicians. We shine only when we make you shine. Call us today at 941-567-6193. Well, at a time when most female artists were content with crooning sappy love songs for Main Street audiences, Vocalist and pianist Linda Gale Lewis was following her own muse, singing rowdy and rousing versions of early rock classics like C.C. Ryder, Jim Dandy, and Baby, You've Got What It Takes. The latter track might hint at what drove Lewis to blaze her own musical path, as it is a duet with Lewis's brother, well-known raconteur and rabble-rouser Jerry Lee Lewis. Lewis would go on to record several times with her brother, but also branched out to record several solo albums throughout the years, as well as a 2000 album with the legendary Van Morrison, and more recently has appeared on albums by Robert Gordon and Ann Margaret. But it scales early tracks that truly showcase her historic importance as a pioneer of rockabilly music and their tracks have now been collected on a brand new compilation entitled Early Sides 1963 through 73 giving fans of vintage rock and rockabilly a chance to discover her unique talents. The audio has been completely remastered by guitar icon Danny B. Harvey who at this had this to say about the collection. It's a well-known fact that from 1961 to the late 70s, Linda Gale Lewis sang and stood beside her big brother, Jerry Lee, both on stage and in the studio. Not as well-known as during that time, she also managed to record her own amazing solo singles in Memphis, Nashville, and L.A. with legendary musicians and producers like Scotty Moore, Jerry Reed, Harold Bradley, Reggie Young, and of course, her brother backing her. Uh, early Sides 1963 through 73 will be released worldwide July 15th on CD, vinyl, and digital. Please welcome American singer, songwriter, pianist, author, and sister of rock and roll legend Jerry Lee Lewis, Linda Gale Lewis, to interviewing the legends. Hello, Linda. Hello, Ray. First off, I want to say, how's Jerry Lee doing? You know he's doing really well. I am so happy to be able to say that because he had a terrible major stroke about three years ago. Right. And he's doing so well. And most people that have that kind of stroke don't live. Right. Well, that, that's good. That's good to hear. I and, mean, you know, with all the COVID stuff, you really got to be careful. Oh, you do. And, he, you know, we've been blessed. He didn't come down with COVID. But he's recently done a gospel album with our cousin, Jimmy Swagger. So he's been busy. Really? That he did a gospel al- album recently, huh? What, is that is that out or not yet? It's coming out this month in uh, July. Oh, fantastic. Now, are you on that album? No, they wouldn't want to have me on that because, you know, they think I'm still playing the devil's music. <laughs> and, I guess, and I guess I am. <laughs> Shame on him, you know? <laughs> he started out that way, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my brother has gotten very... Uh, close to God, right. and he had that horrible stroke, yeah. and then Jimmy invited him to do an album with him in Baton Rouge, there at the place where he has his, uh, uh, they have their ministries there, Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Exactly. And so Jerry, West, they flew Jerry down there, Jerry and his wife, Judith, and, and they all had a big time, and Jerry's singing sounds so good, because I've heard clips of it on Facebook, mm-hmm. and he sounds so good on that album, and of course, so does Jimmy. It's so cool to have a famous family like yours, huh? I... <laughs> Yeah. We are so, I am so blessed. I tell, I tell Jerry sometimes, I say, thank you so much for the song, Great Balls of Fire and a whole lot of shaking going on in High School Confidential, all those songs, because I do them in my act, and they're very handy to have. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you, I, I saw the video of, of his 85th birthday. Uh, is it 85 or it was it yeah 85th birthday and, and you 85 yep and you you all sitting there and you're you're playing all the songs and he's just smiling away <laughs> <laughs> listen i was a nervous wreck when i had to do that because you know my my late cousin mickey gilly was there and of course he's been hugely successful in his career and then of course jimmy was there and jerry was there these three great piano players yep. and they told me i had to do this 
particular song they wanted me to do. And I said, well, where will Jimmy and Jerry and Mickey be when I'm doing that? And they said, oh, they'll be probably, you know, in the dining room or somewhere having some lunch. I said, great. That's great. I don't want to go on in front of them. <laughs> and I walk in there, and there they all three sit real close to the piano. And I, I said to this guy that was producing it, I said, well, I thought you said they weren't going to be in here. He said, look, we don't have much time. You have to go on now. <laughs> but yes, they're in here. I'm like, oh, how could you do that to me? I was so nervous. Oh, uh, you're incredible. You're incredible. You're incredible. You know, I, I saw a real early clip of you in Shindig, and your voice hasn't changed since that video. It's amazing. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. Well, you know, my brother's blessed that way, too. Uh, you know, both of us, as, as we get older, we can still sing, and thank God for that. Well, you must do something to your voice to keep it in that uh, condition, don't you? Or, I mean, you're not a smoker? Are you a smoker? No, you know, I did smoke when I was younger, but I quit. Right. I quit when I was in my uh, early 30s. Huh. Yeah, I talked to Dion Warwick, and I said, man, you you know, with your voice, I know you're not a smoker. And she said, I've been smoking since I was 16. I haven't stopped. <laughs> I guess it just affects... Well, it. I'm not that brave. I yeah. quit. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I, I want to say I'm so sorry about Mickey, by the way. He was loved, he was loved by a lot of people. You know, Ray, he was just the sweetest and mm -hmm. most wonderful man. I, I loved him so much. And I never thought that any one of the three of them would ever leave this earth. Right. You know, I had my picture made with all three of them at Jerry's 85th birthday party. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm so proud of that photo. And, you know, Mickey and I were planning on doing an album together. We'd already started picking out the songs and, and working on it a little bit. And, and it was just, I was just devastated when we lost him. But, see, I never thought he was going anywhere. Yeah. And that's yeah. probably stupid of me. I mean, those guys are in their 80s, but I can't face it. I can't deal with it. So I just always think, well, they're always going to be here. So I was shocked. When that happened with Mickey, I was really shocked. I, I, I don't know if I'll ever get over it. Well, he never seemed old, you know. He seemed so young, and, and you know, uh, that, that's one of the reasons right there. I mean, you know, when you think of somebody real old, you think of somebody that can't even get out of their chair and they're in their walker and, you know, like, you know things like that. But he wasn't well, he like was that. very active. Yeah, he was very active, exactly. You know, you know it, he had a problem with his heart. Oh, did he? I didn't know that. That was early on. Okay. A lot of, uh, most people don't even know this, but Mickey Gilley was one of the very first people to ever have this open heart surgery way way back when he was young pretty young well i didn't know and that. he had something really bad wrong with his heart i don't remember exactly what it was but dr debakey in houston huh. did it and and mickey told me he said linda i had the most beautiful room and they would bring me any kind of food i wanted i said well darling that's wonderful how did you get that he said well i was a guinea pig <laughs> <laughs> Right. And then his heart just, Jerry said that's what he thinks happened, is that his heart just gave out because right. he had trouble. And, and you know, Ray, my brother is so smart, his memory is so good, I had forgotten all about that. Hmm. All about Mickey having heart problems when he was real young. I didn't remember it at all. You know, that's Jerry the most, reminded me, he said, Linda, this is what's happened. That's the most important thing when you keep your mind, you know? And it, it's, oh, I know. The Alzheimer's, that's the worst. That it oh, really is. That's when he, heartbreaking. When you see that, it just breaks my heart. Yeah. My mom had that. Uh, I just lost my dad, but, you know, my dad was 97, and my dad and my mom was 93, so I'm, I'm very lucky I had him, you know, so, so late like that. It, it's, it, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to make it to that age, but... <laughs> well, we can only hope and pray that we do. Exactly. There's so many people. I've lost so many friends at my age, you know, and it's it's it's, it's kind of sad, you know. That's happening a lot to me and to my husband. Really? It happens a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what we're doing wrong. What are we eating, McDonald's or something? Or <laughs> You know, I love McDonald's. I, I know. Sad, but a lot of people like a lot of fancy food and stuff. Yep. You know I love a good old McDonald's hamburger. I know, me too. I like their french fries. <laughs> when I see those arches in Europe when I'm traveling, uh -huh. there we go. There's the American Embassy. Let's stop there. You got to have it. <laughs> well, I listened to the album, and I loved it, okay? 
Uh, oh, you. you got a single out right now. Of course, you got CC Rider out there. You know, it's amazing how many people have used CC Rider. Of course, Elvis uses it sometimes to kick off his uh, his tour. He always he always uses that song. But that that's a song that's been around a long time, and it, it's a great song to sing, isn't it? You know, I love that song, and I loved it, of course, when I was just a kid. But since I've been older now and performing, I, I never have done it very much. Right. But I have to start doing it again now that we have it out. Well, CC Rider, uh, it became a standard. It, 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 it actually was recorded. The first record was in 1924. Can you believe that? By uh, Gertrude Ma Rainey. And, uh, Seriously? It was that long ago? 1924. The song uses mostly a traditional blues lyrics. Tells the story of an unfaithful lover, uh, commonly called an easy rider. And I didn't know that. You know, when I first heard that song, I thought it was about a motorcycle guy. You know, a guy, a CC <laughs> rider, you know? <laughs> you know, I never even thought about what, what it meant, CC rider. I never thought about that. But I, lo I love your version because I love the sax. You got a lot of sax on that. Yeah, that was a good band. I think they called that band the uh, Upsetters, and Jerry recorded a couple of things with them, too. Jerry did Good Golly Miss Molly with them, and it came out on a Sun single. Hmm. Well, I got a lot of favorites on this uh, on this album that I'm going to talk about, because I, like, I love the album. Nothing's Shaking But the Leaves. Uh, your version, I love the best, and it's been done. Oh, thank you. Been done by the even by the Beatles. The Beatles did that in I think '63 or something like that. Now I didn't know the Beatles did that. They did. I'm learning a lot from you today. I think George sang it, but your version I like the best. Well, that's so nice. Thank you, Ray. It was uh, written by Eddie Fontaine um, and a couple other people, uh, th three or four other people, I think. It was uh, first released by Eddie Fontaine in 1958, that song. But yeah, uh, the Beatles did it. Billy Crash Craddock, Dr. Feelgood, uh, Billy Fury. And of, wow. course, of course, they, they mentioned you as well. But um, that's a great song. And they, like I said, you did a hell of a job on that song. I love it. I'm so glad you like it, darling. Uh, here's, here's probably, th this could be one of my favorite all time, Break Up the Party. That which is oh the Dan Penn song. I love that tune, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was so much fun to do that song, and and you know we were recording it in Nashville, and uh, Felton Jarvis was the producer, and and Ray Stevens did a, did the arrangement. Really, he was play, playing on a cowbell, uh -huh. sitting on a cowbell, and I remember Felton Jarvis saying, Ray. We don't need the cowbell. On the <laughs> <laughs> I love Ray Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of famous people in that studio that day, and I got a really big kick out of that. And, and of course, I love Dan Penn, and I love all his songs. Break Up the Party could be kind of a beach song in a way. You know, it reminds me of so many, uh, you know, the uh, like Frankie Va uh, Avalon and Annette Funicello days back back in that time as well. Yeah, it does kind of sound like that, doesn't it? It does sound like that. You, you, I guess that's what Ray was going for in the uh, arrangement. I think so. <laughs> I, you, you you know you can you can do any genre with your voice. You, you really can. You know, I, I could hear you doing. Well, I know gospel for sure, but I could hear you doing some R and B stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, maybe you've got what it takes as a little bit of an R&B flavor. I think so. I think you're right on that. I'm a big Brooke Benton fan. Mm -hmm. and I, I loved his, uh, him and Dinah Washington did that song. I loved their version of it, too. You, you did also, you did Sitting and Thinking. Was that a Charlie Rich song? That that was a Charlie Rich song, yeah. exactly. Yep. What did, he, what did he call him? The the gray fox? The gray fox. Yeah, he, he was. He, oh yeah, I was a big fan of his. Yep. Yeah, I think all the ladies like Charlie. <laughs> oh yeah, he was a charmer. <laughs> sure. And you met, you mentioned uh, "Baby, You've Got What It Takes," of course, and uh, Jerry Lee's on that tune with you. Oh uh, yeah, well, that, that's our duet of it, and and it was fun to do that. I really enjoyed doing that song with Jerry. Have you ever had any dueling, dueling pianos, you and Jerry? It... Gosh, no, I wouldn't dare try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. I, I, I figure brother and sister, you know, you should be doing that. <laughs> I, do, I do that gig here in Texas with Earl Pooball. Okay. We, we get together about twice a year and do a dueling pianos gig, and it's so much fun. Yeah. And he's telling Johnny Cash stories, and I'm telling Jerry Lee Lewis stories, and 
we're going back and forth, and, and, and then I've got Johnny Cash stores as well, and he has Jerry Lee stores as well. So that is so that's cool. a lot of fun doing that with him. That is so cool. Of course, you did Jim Dandy, the, the Laverne Baker song, and I've, I've had... Um, I've had actually had uh, uh, Jim Dandy Mangrum on the show several times from Black Oak, Arkansas, who who actually made the biggest hit with that tune. But your version's incredible. I mean, I, I well, thank you. It's a great, great version of that tune. Well, thank you so much. You know, I love that song, and I'm a big Laverne Baker fan, so yep. that's why I did it. Now, uh, does the song Louisiana which that's coming from? Well, that's that's a song that I wrote. Um, it's a song that I wrote about my home state. You did. I did. I did. I wrote that song about my home where I come from mm -hmm. around Faraday. Well, Faraday's a horrible, dumpy little town. But then when you go outside of Faraday and you go to the sandbar and you go across to Natchez, Mississippi, it's so beautiful there. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking about when I wrote the song. I love it because, you know, I, I was looking all over the Internet and I said, maybe she, she wrote this tune because I, 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 I wasn't sure about that. I did write it. I, I did a little bit of songwriting in my day, and I'm yep. still. They told me recently that I've got to write three songs pretty soon now. Yeah. <laughs> my son in law told me that because we're getting ready to do an, another album, and I said, Hey, I'm going to co write. You're going to have to help me. I think you're good at it. Did You, you wrote, did you co write What is Love? You know, um, I did. I think I co wrote that with somebody, and also, you know, that was so long ago, but I definitely did have someone writing that with me. I'm just not quite sure who it was. Uh, Cecil Harrison. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Because uh, I love the lyrics on that. It, it's so true, you know? Well, you know, we were traveling together, and it okay. was Kenny Lovelace. Right. My, ex, my other ex husband, one of my other ex husbands. And so I had Kenny Lovelace and Cecil. And myself traveled together. Well, in the in the old days, I was married to Cecil. We got a divorce. Okay. Then I met and married Kenny, and Kenny was on the road with us. And he's my brother's uh, band leader. And then I was traveling with Kenny, and Cecil was my ex-husband. But then that didn't work out with Kenny, so we got a divorce. And then I was traveling with two ex-husbands. Oh, but geez. then I married <laughs> Cecil again. Mm. And then Kenny was my ex-husband. Oh my god. And then that didn't work, and and. I don't know how you kept always, always really. I don't know how you kept up with your ex husbands. <laughs> What a surprise she got. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just burned them and didn't even look at them. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. <laughs> I said, Aunt Stella, don't buy any more magazines that about Linda Lovelace, because that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> now, what? She's probably, well, now what is she into now? <laughs> oh, she was panicked. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. That's a great story, though. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about Gather Around Children. Because um, there's a lot of, lot of it, it seems like there's a lot of people involved with that song. Now, t tell me a little bit about where, where that came from and, and who's responsible for that song. Well, that's another one of those. We're driving along in the car. Right. We're riding along in the car and we're riding. And uh, Cecil Harrelson came up with the idea for the song. He didn't he didn't have a melody and he he didn't have it structured right either. And he had written it to the tune of uh, the Twelfth of Never. Which right. I said, you know, there's already a song with that melody, so you can't use that. So I wrote the melody, and then I, I fixed it and put some lyrics in to make, you know, to make the chorus. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a chorus. He just had the basic idea. And then we finished it, and um, that's where that song, I think it was just the two of us. I don't think Kenny helped us write that one, did he? Is it, is, does Kenny Lovelace have a writer's credit on that? I don't think he does. I don't see it, no. If he helped us, he, he got cheated. <laughs> he got his name on there. <laughs> but, but that's how that song happened. 
And I always loved that song. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful song. And Cecil had really a lot of talent when it came to lyrics. He was really good. Now, it mentioned, was it Jordan Ayers involved at all in that song, or? It, it mentions you know, a Jordan Ayers somewhere. I remember who was singing, the, well, I know the, I, I'm trying to remember who sang on it on Jerry's version of it. Mm-hmm. You know, Jerry did it, and then I did it. Right. We both did it, but I, it could have been the Jordan Ayers. I know I have had the Jordan Ayers sing on some of my recordings before. Yeah. That's the way I have. But it would have been some of those really great Nashville singers. Yep. And and the, uh, there were times that we would have Gordon from the Jordanaires right. with some la- with some other ladies and another guy that he sang with, and that was kind of a different group. Right. But Gordon's voice was so distinct, and you, it always did when he was singing with anybody, it sounded like the Jordanaires because it was his voice that you heard most of all. I had Ray on the show, Ray Walker. Oh really? Oh yeah. how nice. Yeah, he, he's a he was he's a hell of a nice guy. Really, really cool guy. Oh, they're just they they were lovely guys. I, they're all gone now, aren't they, Ray? I think Ray's still around. Oh, is he? Yeah, oh, I think he's still around. I haven't heard anything else about it. I mean, he's in his eighties, I'm sure, but late eighties maybe. But uh, the time's flying by, isn't it, Ray? Way too fast, and as you get older, it gets it. it you know, it's like they're pushing you. <laughs> I tell you, I panic every time I think about how old I am. I hate it. <laughs> well, you know, your your age is the new 50. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I've heard that one before, and I love it. Yeah, I mean, that's I, right. I always tell my husband, I said, now, honey, we're in our, our 70s. I'm 75, and you're 79. That's right. But that's the new 60 and 69. <laughs> well, then you, you got more energy than I got, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Energy only when I'm playing music. That's the, you know, I love it so much. Yeah. I, I really enjoy it so much, and I don't think about being tired or, mm. or anything like that. And 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 I guess that's the reason that I can still do it is because I love it so much. Well, playing the piano is a good workout, especially the way you play it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You know, I I love playing the piano, and uh, I've learned a lot from my brother. Mm-hmm. But I don't play. You know, of course, I don't play exactly like him as much as the the Jerry Lee Lewis tribute artists do. Right. But I have my own style, but I do use some of his piano licks, which a lot of people do. Yeah. I mean, you're you're good at it. I mean, let me tell you, you're you're ac- excellent piano play- player. You really well, are. Thank you so much. And of course, I learned a lot playing piano with Van Morrison because yeah. that was a different kind of music. Right. And, and when you have to stretch and learn something different like that, it makes you better all around. It right. makes you. I was a ten times better piano player after that one year playing all those Van Morrison songs. Yep. I improved so much that I did a recording session after I got back to America, and, and that and that was over, and I was back home in America, and I did this session, and I came home with it, and I was playing it for my husband, and he said, well, who did y'all get to play the piano? I said, that's me! <laughs> <laughs> he didn't recognize it. <laughs> How, how'd you get involved with Van, anyway? How'd you guys first meet? Well, you know, uh, Eddie and I were at the King's Hotel in Newport, Kentucky, and I would do a show there, mm-hmm. and Van came to the show, and I didn't know that he enjoyed it, because, you know, he did, He doesn't have the greatest personality in the world. Right. And he was complaining to my husband, because he said Bert Burns didn't pay him for the, the bang sessions and stuff, and for the bang releases and hit records. Just the brown-eyed girl. That was what they were talking about. Okay. My husband broke that record. Mm-hmm. You know, my husband is, was a promotion man. Right, right. For, Works for a lot of different people, and he yeah. promoted Brown Eyed Girl. And he, when he was promoting it, he made it a big hit. Mm-hmm. It, it just broke out, you know, in Memphis and in the South and mm-hmm. various places with Eddie promoting it. And and Eddie was telling him about it. And Van said, "Well, you know, I didn't get paid." So he <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't really that nice to us. So I was quite shocked when yeah. my agent called me. Yeah. And said, "You know, uh, Van wants to do some recording with you." Huh. And, well, the first thing he said was. Do you want to get together? We're going to have dinner with Van Morrison. And I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, he might want to do some recording with you, and it, you would be really well paid to do that. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a struggling artist and always need money. So I said, okay, when is dinner and where is it? <laughs> we had dinner and we did the album. The album came out. I did some touring with him. And I learned a lot from, from all that. Mm-hmm. The, um, the songs that I played with him, things yeah. like the jazz version of Moon Dance and mm-hmm. And it was all kinds of stuff I had to figure out. I was playing the piano, right? 
all the time. Mm -hmm. I would wake up in the mornings going over things. Because mm. I was determined to do a good job, even though Van said, well, you're here to promote our album. You don't have to play at all. We'll get somebody else to play. Yeah. And I said, no, I don't want to leave the stage and have people say, oh, she's done her bit, now she has to leave because she can't play Van Morrison's songs. You know, there's a lot of ego involved in this business. That's right. That's right. <laughs> We've all got it, don't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It, it's so cool, though, that what you know you can play with um, other uh, musicians that are involved with other genres, and because you pick up so much from them, well, and you, you don't, do. yeah, if yeah. You push yourself and you do it. You you learn a lot. It, it's a it's a good idea. I'm glad I did it. I'm yep. glad I did it. And of course, uh, Van can't help the way his personality is. That's <laughs> just what he is. He's so talented, and he's such a great songwriter. Yep. And he does a great show. I, you know, he's a great showman on mm -hmm. stage. I mean, he don't do the same kind of show that Tom Jones does. Right. right. When, when Tom came to see us, you know, out in L.A. Uh, in the Beverly Hills, and he was uh, coming out to do one song with Van. And Van said, "Listen, we got to get him on stage and get him off quick. He'll take over the whole show." <laughs> But yeah, it, it was a it was a great part of my life that I I am proud that I got that done. Oh yeah. But I was so happy to get back on the road and play rock and roll that's and rock right. and Billy and country. Yeah. Because that's what I love. Yeah. I I can I can see you playing with so many rock artists, you know, so many of them. Uh, well, I did have the opportunity to play some with Robert Gordon. That was fun. Yeah. That. Yep. Yep. And I'm getting ready now to do a, a, a tribute to the Cramps. Oh really? Is that right? Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a punk rocker. For that, that, that's pretty cool. You're gonna be now. You're now you're in the punk. You gotta do something with your hair. <laughs> well, you don't have to know anything about music. Just be a punk. Exactly. You gotta turn your hair green, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I am excited about that. I, I love all kinds of music, and and I do like the cramps. I love the cramps. So mm -hmm. I'm so so honored that they're gonna let me be <clears> doing one of the tracks on their. Uh, Tribute album, Cleopatra. Very cool. Yeah, Cleopatra is a great, great organization. They, they are wonderful. Yeah, and just absolutely wonderful people. Yeah. They they brought you know they 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 keep music alive the good the good music alive which I like about them. I I've worked with Cleopatra for a long time now with a lot of their artists and they, they've been a good, very good organization. Well, what's so wonderful about it is that Brian and his wife and I met his mother-in-law uh, mm -hmm. Yvonne's mother. And they're just the most wonderful people. And, and Brian loves to pay the artist and treat the artist right. Right, exactly. And I'm not familiar with that. I'm used yeah. to the record company people being very different from that. I but, know. But he, he's just a wonderful person. And I, I'm just so happy that I had the chance to be on his label. Exactly. Back, back to your album real quick. Uh, Working Girl, did you write that? No, darling, I no? didn't, because I ain't never been a working girl for that kind of time. <laughs> <laughs> I had one job, one time in my whole life, Ray. What was that? I, I worked one day. Yeah, one day? <laughs> I worked one day on that job. So oh, my goodness. Boy, you so lucky then. <laughs> that's the best I could do. That's great. That's great. The, you, you know what's so interesting? Okay, Ivory Tower, which is a... I'm so sorry. I Ivory Tower is another one of my favorite tunes. Now, oh, that's such a pretty song. Uh, that's little corny me to do that song. It is beautiful. The, now, Ivory Tower is a popular song written by Jack Fulton. Okay, uh, it was sung by I think Gail Storm back in the day. That's right. Now, did you know that there's another Ivory Tower that was actually written by Van Morrison, a, a totally different song? I didn't know that. Now that's strange. <laughs> so much so because Van told me some, one time, he said, you know, you can get an idea for a song, you can just take it from another song because that, that song he did that he wrote, Have I Told You Lately That I Left You, mm -hmm. he, he got that idea from the Carl Smith song, Have right. I Told You Lately That I Left You. I thought that was so strange because your relationship with Van Morrison that you did Ivory Tower and, and there's another Ivory Tower, a, a different... Isn't that funny? Yeah. I, I gotta hear that. I gotta find that and listen to it because I didn't know anything about that song. He didn't do that song when I was on tour with him. It's a 1986 from the album No Guru, No Method, No Teacher. That's, okay. that's the album, okay? Well, if you want to look it up. Check that out. I Want to Be a Sensuous Woman. That should have been a hit. 
That should have been a big hit, right? Well, you know, at the time they had come out with that book. I, I got the idea for that song from that book. It's a that you know I was a top forty disc jockey back in the late seventies. I know what a hit is. You know what should be you know on the radio and should be a big hit. That should have been a hit. Well, I, I thought so too, and I was a little bit disappointed that it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, uh, you you debuted the song on in concert. Would I would I remember? I did, but I wish I'd have worn something different. And you know, but you, you know, it comes back to haunt you. Know? I'll come back to haunt you. <laughs> is that what it ha- is that what happened? You didn't write the, wear the right outfit or what? <laughs> I wore that outfit when I did another song, The Strangers in the Night. Okay. You know, when I started doing rock and roll, which I needed to do with rock and roll, so that Jerry Lee fans would come out and support me, and the Elvis fans right. and everybody. Right. So my first gig in Europe, they thought I was going to be terrible because I hadn't been over there doing rock and roll at all. I had been over there just a few times singing backing vocals with my brother and maybe doing one song or something. So they thought it was going to be funny. Mm-hmm. And they were all, the, some of my friends over there now told me, they said, well, you know, we were all sitting in the bar watching a video of Strangers in the Night, and I want to be a sensuous woman, laughing, thinking that this was going to be the funniest concert that we had ever been to. Huh. But it turned out really not. That's strange. <laughs> yeah, I had, to, I had to make it happen, so yeah. I was rocking. Well, you know, maybe you should have wore, you know, like uh, I, I get Maria Maldara on the show from time to time, and I always tell her, you know, when she sang Midnight on the Oasis, you know, she... Oh, I love that song. Well, she, you know, she was, she was wearing a very skimpy little outfit, you know, showing her tummy and, you know, not wearing a, a bra or anything. You know, maybe you should have done something like that. <laughs> oh, she is so good. I love her. <laughs> Cause it is a sen- I mean, it is a, a. You're talking about a sensuous woman, so, you know. <laughs> well, that's true. Got to play the that part. Is, Got. We had some good musicians on that session too. We had Charlie Chalmers and really some of those people, and, and did that one in Memphis. Yeah, I would also mention Wild, Wild, Wild. Now that you did that with Robbie. Uh, we had a blast. You want to talk about fun in a studio? We had a blast. I love the cover. <laughs> Listen, I turned up for that photo session, and they said to me, they said, the, the guy making the pictures, he said, can you stick your head down in a water tank and open your eyes and scream? That's I weird. I said, no, <laughs> I can't. They said, well, can you just scream then? I said, yeah, I can scream. And <laughs> so Robbie went in and did the first screaming, uh-huh. and, they were, and they were trying to be gentle with me, and the guy said, oh, okay, now you come on in and just do the best you can. And, and, and it'll be your turn, and, and just do the best you can. I don't know if you can do what Robbie did, but just try to do the best you can. I went in there, and I screamed my head off. And then they said, well, Robbie, you have to come back and scream again, because Linda Gale has out-screamed you. And we, I, I, that really happened. I love the album. You, it, it's like, you know, you see the cover, you don't know what to expect. <laughs> oh, listen, he is, he is the greatest songwriter. Uh-huh. I, I just, I love his songwriting, and I love his guitar playing and his singing he's a great singer oh he's so great well your album i, I gave it five stars because i loved it it was a nice Thank you. very it was a it was a fun album very nice uh very great selection i mean if you like uh nostalgia you like country you like i mean there's a little bit of everything on that album really well i'm so proud of it and i really appreciate my son-in-law putting it together and mm-hmm. doing the mastering and i appreciate it Brian and all his crew for putting it out. I'm really excited about it. And I love those songs. Those songs are special to me. Every I know. It's, it's fun to do covers, too, isn't it? I, I, there's more artists doing covers now than ever before, you know? Well it, well, it is. And then, of course, we've got the song like Louisiana, which nobody else has done. Exactly. I don't, I don't know if anybody has ever done Before the Snow Flies, right? Huh. You know, Louisiana. Have you have you pitched that to the maybe, maybe I don't know a state song or something? I wouldn't know who to go to to get that done. Go I don't to have any contacts for that, but I did a radio program a couple of days ago, and that nice lady said, "Well, I'm going to ask them why they don't have this song about Louisiana." They should. You know, uh, you want I, me to? I wish they would. I'll, I'll send it in myself. I'll send it to the governor, uh, whatever it takes. So 
so that that nice one of those nice ladies said, "Well, do you know what the state song is for for Louisiana?" And I said, "It's uh, I know exactly what it is. It's You Are My Sunshine." Oh, is it really? Huh? I didn't know so, that. So what, that's not about the state of Louisiana. No. And my song is not at all. <laughs> I mean, that could be about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to mention to people go on YouTube because you got a lot of great music on there, and I really like when you play with the Ghost City Band. With who, darling? The, the Ghost City Band. Oh, the Ghost City Band. Yeah, I like when you play with them. There, there's some good musicians there. I love going to Austria. Yeah. And playing with those guys, and I have the nicest audience there. You know, I may not be playing stadiums and stuff like the Rolling Stones or even big theaters like my brother. Right. But my little my gigs have like 200 people sometimes like that one. It's an intimate atmosphere, and you're close to the people, and you get to talk to them all. And I spend as much time talking to people after the show mm -hmm. and before the show as I do doing the actual show because it's so much fun to get to know people. And those guys in, in Austria, they're just wonderful. You're so you're so big in Europe, you know. It's I I, I see that through you too because you get a lot of a lot of comments, a lot of people really like you over there. I've had a really good time there. Yeah, I really have. Huh? It's very successful. I'm so thankful for that. Right. But I've worked really hard, and it's it's uh, it's been coming along really nicely. I do enjoy going over there. Did 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 uh, Jerry Lee? Did he tour? Europe back in the day. Well, I think. Well, of course, that's when the uh, bad publicity happened. Okay. When the scandal happened. Right. When he married married our cousin, that was thirteen. Right. That was he went to uh, uh, London and the UK. All right. That was that that tour got canceled because everything was so screwed up. But then, of course, he went back in the sixties and did that album uh, live at the Star Club, which is. To me, the greatest live album ever mm -hmm. recorded. It is so wonderful. So he thought, we spent over there a lot, and then I had the thrill of my life. Because, you know, I had to stop working with him in 1980. I guess it was 1987, because his, his wife didn't want to have me there on the show because she wanted to be on the show. Oh, my so I goodness. Had to, I had to get out on my own. Yeah. And, but, but then, in 2008, the promoters in Europe said we have to have Linda Gale Lewis on the show because the shows aren't long enough, and if we have her on the show in right. 30 minutes to 45 minutes, the show will be long enough. Yep. And so I, I was then invited to tour with him in Europe, and it was so much fun, mm -hmm. and it was so wonderful to be with him then, because I got to spend a lot more time with him, because we were on the road together, you know, I'd see him all the time during the day when we were traveling and then backstage I'd hang out with him. Right. It was so wonderful, right? And I enjoyed those shows so much. And then it was so much fun that Jerry said, well, let's do some of the ones in America, too. Yep. So I did a lot of these shows here in America as well. But sometimes I'd be in Europe touring and I'd miss uh, a few of them. But I did get to open for him at B.B. King's mm -hmm. for his uh, birthday when he, I think he turned, I think that's when he turned 82, maybe. You know, it's so great that you get along, you know, with with your siblings like that because it doesn't well, happen. Oh, I love him. Spe I love him. We lost our sister. Oh, that I'm was so, so, so hard for us. Yeah. But I love my brother. He's the most wonderful person, and I, I miss him so much. And I don't get to see him as much as I'd like to because right. it's so far. I live so far away from Memphis. It's so far from taking from Austin and Wimberley to get right. up to Memphis, Tennessee. It's a long drive, but. I'm, I'll be seeing him coming back through there when I, because I'm playing in Memphis on my tour. Oh, okay. You, you know I'm what's an extra day there. Jer, what Jerry did, which was so great, you know, you always hear, you know, of course the news always puts the bad stuff, but what he did when he made money and you guys didn't have money, and he and he helped the family out. You know how rare that is nowadays. <laughs> um, listen, I, I think that was rare. Really, all the days. Yeah. I don't know if there's anybody in the world that ever just totally shared everything that exactly. they had with their family. Exactly. Exactly. And, and not ask for it back later on, you know? <laughs> that happens oh, a lot. Yeah, I mean, he just, it was just the most wonderful thing. I, I tell you, I hated living that sheriff off the show. Get off the school bus in front of all those people with. You know, with that shack there, and yeah. oh, it was just terrible. Yeah. And I was so happy when we moved from there. <laughs> you said you said your mama had only two dresses, right? <laughs> she 
she had two dresses. Mm-hmm. She had one that she wore at home, right? And then she had one to wear to church. And and, and uh, she bought a Cadillac. <laughs> well, yeah, Jerry told her said, you know, he had done so much for us. He got that beautiful house. Yeah. The first house Mama picked out it was in frame house. Uh huh. And uh, Jerry said, "Well, this isn't right. This is not going to do." And it, and Mama said. Oh, I, I thought it might be too much. He mm-hmm. said, no, you don't understand. This isn't nice enough for you. This is, you can't know. This is not right. And he went and bought that beautiful brick home. You know, back in the 50s, we had the little picture window oh, yeah. in the house. And he bought, it was a brand new subdivision, brand new house, never been lived in. That's and good. we just got uh, into that beautiful house, and he gave us $1,000 to go back home. Mm-hmm. So me and Frankie Jean and Mama went to Darcy's dress shop and just bought everything they had. And <laughs> well, what a good... And then, and then Jerry called another couple of days later and he said, of course, we got beautiful furniture. Jerry put beautiful furniture in mm. that house. And so then Jerry said, well, Mama, I think you need a new car. So she went and got a new car and he called back a couple of days after that and said, you know, Mama, I was just wondering, did you get a Ford or a Chevrolet? She said, oh, no, son. I got a Fleetwood Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> she, she knows what she wanted. <laughs> and every year, he bought her a brand new Fleetwood Cadillac. Oh, every the year, store. huh? Wow. Every year. That's something. It's all it's all in your book, The Devil, Me, and Jerry Lee, which I got to buy, by the way. I got to get that book. That sounds like a you great know, I, book. I would send you one, but I don't think I have even one copy left of <laughs> I know. all of them away. And I think it's out of print. Is it, is it out of print? I, I, I think it's available on Amazon. It might still be. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get that. I know one of my fans bought it recently, and it had been signed. Right. So it, it was one that was a, a used copy, but it was in good shape. Yeah. I just want to talk a little bit about Jerry Lee. Uh, growing up with Jerry, uh, what was that like? What, did you know that he had that gift for entertaining at an early age? Well, you know, Mom and Daddy always said, because we were really poor. And right. Mom and Daddy would always say, you know, we're going to have a lot more and things are going to be a lot better when Jerry makes it. Mm-hmm. That was the, uh, that was what was going on at my house all the time. When huh. Jerry makes it. That's it interesting. Wasn't if Jerry makes it. Right. But it was when Jerry makes it. They they knew that he would make it. Now, now what, so what, I, I grew up believing that. What did he do that they had so much confidence in him? What was he doing? Playing piano? Was he singing? From a, when, small, from a small child, right? Right. He could just sit down at the piano and play it, and, and just he just it, he is a genius mm. on the piano. Mm. There's nobody like him. There's nobody ever played like him. And it's, when you listen to things like when he recorded, for instance, and I think it might be a bootleg recording or something. I don't think it's that much. I don't think you can get it that easily. I think it's, I don't think it's available. But the song, for instance, "Lady of Spain," right? And, and the way he plays that. You know, my husband's a big Jerry Lewis fan. He said, listen to this. <laughs> a friend of ours sent it to him. He said, I can't believe this. Listen to this. Lady of Spain. So uh, it's not just rock and roll that he can play. And he plays the most beautiful country music. I mean, he plays his solos and uh, films on those country recordings, on hmm. some of them, that sounded like classical music, the way he was playing, like little trills and things. But, you know, I'd, 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 I'd love to hear him play uh, music like that. You know, like if you played some classical and things like that, that would be so cool to hear, you know. Well, it sounds like classical. If you, when you're listening to those old standards that he did on the Hall of Fame, right. series, volume one and volume two, right. if, you, if you listen to the way he's playing the piano on those particular songs, you can hear that it, it, it almost it sounds like little Mozart trills and things. Mm. Anybody else could try to do that on a country song, yeah. and they would never be able to make it fit. It would never work. It would sound terrible. Mm. But because he is a genius, it works, and it works beautifully. And that's the most, on those two albums, Volume 1 and Volume 2, Country Hall of Fame, the Country Hall of Fame, Country Hall of Fame, <laughs> he absolutely plays the most wonderful piano and his vocals are so incredible mm-hmm. in my humble opinion every song every one of those old standards mm-hmm. that he sings is better than the original wow you, you know what's so interesting though is how the rock and roll evolved in that period the pioneering you know 
it's like where you know you know you know it started way back when way back in the blues and and all that and then there's gospel and there's country yeah, the gospel is a big influence on it sure but all of a sudden there's this new sound you know this new rock and roll oh, yeah. sound and it's it's amazing how it just you know the pioneers like jerry lee it, it just happened <laughs> Somebody, like somebody said, you had a tiny little radio back then. Yep. And it it replaced the big band. Yep. People instead of listening to a big band, right? They wanted to hear uh, Hound Dog and uh, Great Balls of Fire mm -hmm. and uh, Long Tall Sally on the tiny little radio. Exactly. And you can it can tell where the Beatles got all their sound because it, you know the the early Beatles stuff came from all that music. You know, it really did. And they appreciated the American 50s artists, and they were always so nice about it. Yep. But what, what did Jerry Lee think about the, the British invasion when they, when they hit? Um, he was calling them long-haired SOB. <laughs> singing, actually saying SOB. Uh, <laughs> he was uh, doing that. And uh, then when John Lennon came to see us at the Roxy Theater and came right. backstage, to our dressing room. Right. That changed everything. Jerry never said another word about the Beatles that wasn't really nice after that. Really? It was all something really nice because he was so humbled by that. Right. Because when they told me, and, and I, I told Kenny Ludlow to move out on stage, I said, somebody told me that John Lennon is here and he's sitting up in that balcony. Kenny said, don't be ridiculous. John Lennon isn't here. And so I thought, well, maybe Kenny's right, you know, maybe he's not here. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting in the dressing room, and somebody knocks on the door, and they open the door, and there stands John Lennon mm -hmm. and his uh, road manager standing there. Yeah. And I, all, I freaked, because, you know, the, the Beatles, that happened in, in, during my generation. Right, that's right. So I, I knew how famous John Lennon was, and I'm like, ah, oh, my God, that is John <laughs> Lennon standing there. So he walks in, Jerry's sitting there with his leg, like his ankle up on his Right. And and John kneels down and kisses the bottom of his shoe. Huh. How about that? that? Embarrassed you. Yeah. <laughs> he said. <laughs> How about that? To my father uh, was uh, killer. He called killer. Yeah. <laughs> now killer. Don't have to do that. You, you know, if, if if anyone appreciated the early pioneers, it was John Lennon. He got down on his knee, kissed the bottom of Jerry's shoe. That's something, Jerry huh? Jerry didn't know what in the world. He was flabbergasted. That was he interesting. Was shocked. Yeah, that was interesting. I bet you met some uh, some biggies in your time, huh? My goodness, right. I have been so fortunate. And, and I wish that I'd have had an iPhone back then to make a whole bunch of pictures. Yeah. Did you meet Johnny Cash? Oh, well, I was around Johnny Cash, because, you know, my brother toured with him quite a bit. Yep, yep. So, but I didn't really know him that well. <laughs> who, who, who were some of the people that you kind of connected with? He, he was quiet. Mm-hmm. Very quiet. But I got a big kick out of seeing Robert Plant in London at, when Jerry did his 80th birthday party. Is that right? The Palladium. Yeah, we're at the Palladium. And uh, they have me and my daughter going on first uh -huh. and doing, I think we did 30 minutes or something. And then they had to take a break because they were organizing things, because this was Jerry's farewell show and his birthday as well. They were organizing that Robert Plant and Ringo Starr were going to bring this birthday cake out to Jerry. Hmm. Well, I'd already run right into Ringo Starr in Jerry's dressing room. Right. And, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know Ringo Starr was there. Nobody told me. And I opened the door and walk in. And there's Ringo Starr right in my face. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, it's Ringo Starr. <laughs> I said, oh, excuse me. And I almost ran into him. But then after the show, after our part of the show was over and they were setting things up, this nice man walked up to me and he said, you know, I really enjoyed you and your daughter. I thought y'all did a great show. Mm -hmm. I said, well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I said to my daughter, I walked over to my daughter and I said, little, I call her little baby. I said, little baby? That nice man there, <laughs> that we did a really good show and that he really liked it. Mm -hmm. and she said, Mother, that nice man is Robert Plant. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. Okay, I'm going back. <laughs> I'm back over there. I said, do you mind if I make a selfie with you? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> so I still have that selfie. 
company and walk a plant. <laughs> I, I know you did something with Carl Perkins, didn't you? Didn't you do uh, you were on the show together or something like that? Well, that we was on the show. That it was Jerry's show, and right. uh, of course, uh, Carl was a guest on it, and they wanted me to do Daddy sang bass with him. Right. And it turned out really great. Yep. And, and that I, I'm really proud of that. I, I sometimes will put that on my Facebook and show it to, to people. Oh, he was it's incredible. That I really like a lot. Yeah, me too. I really like Carl Perkins. Oh, he was wonderful and yeah. a really sweet guy. Yeah. Now he did talk to me a lot. Yep. When we was on the, I, I got in the car with him and Jerry and uh, Johnny Cash. It was a limo. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it wasn't a stretch limo. It was a smaller limo. Mm-hmm. They were going to fanfare, and I said, you know, I want to get in that car with those guys. And I, I went up there and knocked <laughs> on the window. Well, I, I normally would never ride with Jerry because back in the day, I, I smoked cigarettes and Jerry wouldn't allow me to smoke. Oh, okay. So I had to ride with the band. Right. So I could smoke. Right. So, but he never knew the reason. He just knew I didn't ride with him. Right. So when I'm knocking on that on that glass window saying, let me in, I want to ride with y'all. And he's like, why do you want to ride in here? You never want to ride with her. <laughs> I said, because. He said, and this is crowded. He said, this is not a stretch limo. I said, I want to ride with three legends. <laughs> That's right. He said, well, okay, get in. And I don't blame you. <laughs> me and Carl Perkins talked the whole way mm-hmm. to Panda Fair. We had a blast. Yeah. What a lovely man he was. But Johnny Cash did not say one word to me. How about he that? He was very, very sweet, but he was very quiet. Very quiet, huh? Did, very quiet. Did, did you meet Elvis? Oh, yes. Yeah? Oh, yes, I did. Oh, boy. There, there might be a story there, the way you're saying saying this. <laughs> well, it was pretty amazing because, you know, honestly, Ray, I'm a Jerry Lee Lewis fan, and I, I wasn't that as excited as I should have been. Uh-huh. But here, here's what happened. I, I walked into this little small theater in, in Memphis, the, um, the Memphians, mm-hmm. but it has a little small lobby. And I walked in there, and I was about, I guess, 12 years old or something. I don't know exactly how old I was. I was really young. And I looked across there. And I saw uh, Elvis standing in front of the concession stand, and he'd rented it, you know, so they could watch a movie. He couldn't just go out to a movie. He had to rent the little small right. theater, and they would go there and watch the movie. Right. So I saw that light on his face, and I thought, wow. And then he saw us, and he started walk- walking toward us. And the closer he got to us, the better he looked. <laughs> and when he got over there to us, he, I shook hands with him, and he kissed my hand with his sexy lips. <laughs> sexiest lips ever. <laughs> and, and then people will ask me, they'll say, well, did he look as good in person as he did in the movie? I said, he looked at least 10 times better. Yeah. Because you could not, the, the camera mm-hmm. could not capture how beautiful that man was. I know. I, I, in, in my opinion, yep. he was the most beautiful yep. man that ever walked on the face of this earth. Mm. He was blessed. You know, God blessed him mm-hmm. with, with masculine beauty. He was Masculine and beautiful at the same time. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's a shame you couldn't have been one of your husbands. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? I never had any desire to try to get myself involved with, you know, big stars. Yeah. You know, there's, well, there's a name for that. <laughs> People that want to be with big yeah. stars. You know, I, but I, I never wanted that. And I always thought that might be a, a, a road to unhappiness. Yeah. And it has been for a lot of people. Well, your, your current husband's kind of well-known, isn't he? He's very well-known. Yeah. Of course, not on, he's never been, like, doing live shows and stuff. And we don't have people just walking up to us and saying, oh, are you so-and-so? Right. Because he works behind the scenes. And, you know, it's like a lot of people have said, if you want to be underappreciated in the music business, be a promotion man. Yeah. And you can be underappreciated. But my husband did a lot for stacks and and they have recognized that and they have, mm-hmm. they have said in, in a, a post on the their facebook page and, and uh, instagram yep they wrote a nice thing about it saying how that it wouldn't have been what it was without eddie because eddie was the first That's right to be able to take that music and get it played on top 40 radio you know radio was uh segregated back then mm-hmm. well see i appreciate i appreciate people like your husband you know, because, you know, th- these are the guys that make things happen, you know? And I, well, he, he really worked hard, and yeah. he did three, three cities a day, right? Mm. Yeah, I... I the airplanes going and getting that stuff on the radio, and yep. that's when they had those... That's when they went from selling 100,000 R&B records and blues records yeah. to selling uh, millions. 
Yep. And, and you know, Ruth Thomas, he really appreciated Eddie, and he would always say, Eddie, I wouldn't have ever had what I had, and Carla wouldn't either without you. Because Eddie promoted their stuff. He got it on Top 40 Radio. He was the first to do that. He's mm-hmm. a hero. He is a hero. I went to uh, broadcasting school. It was owned by CBS back in the late 70s. And all the all the teachers were old DJs from back back in the day, you know, like early '60s, late '50s, and things like that. And they they would talk about the old days of payola when you, they'd pay people to put a record on and things like that. Which, in my opinion, wasn't such a bad idea. I wish they'd do that today. <laughs> because. <laughs> A, a nickel for every time I saw my ex husband Cecil Harrison give five hundred dollars to a DJ. Like <laughs> they should do that today because the music today on Top Forty Radio is horrible. You know, and, and my, my brother appreciated those guys playing. That's right. Playing his records. That's right. He appreciated. D- he wanted to give them a little gift. D- DJs, DJs were kings back then. Today they're they're just on tape, and you know it's just a shame. And they're not they're, they're, there are no DJs anymore like there used to be. It's a shame. No, it, it, they're not as creative as, no. you know, as, as as you are. I know you're a creative DJ, and I appreciate that. But you know, uh, Judd Phillips went on the road with sixty thousand dollars because they couldn't get anybody to play a lot of shaking going up. Mm. Nobody would play it. Really? They said it was vulgar. It was vulgar, and nobody would play it, and that was it. And so <laughs> Sam Phillips and Judd Phillips, had, their brothers, right. they'd had a, they, were, they had had a falling out. So he had to get Judd back because he could not, and he believed in, in that record. Mm-hmm. He believed in it, and he had to get Judd back to promote it. Of course, Sam was promoting It'll Be Me, which was the, the A side, and that was the wrong side to be promoting. But uh, it didn't take Judd long to figure it out. What a wonderful promotion man he was and he went on the road with sixty thousand dollars in payola and he had them playing a whole lot of shaking going on and he got jerry on the steve allen show right and he knew he knew somebody in where he could get him on that show and i tell you what it started flying off the shelves then mm-hmm. <laughs> well the thing about jerry too what not only was it a great song but you know he, he had the personality that you couldn't see on the radio so you definitely had to get him out there live <laughs> so oh, people would oh, see yeah, him. it helped so much. And, and, you know, when they went to the studio recording It'll Be Me, they'd gotten so frustrated with it, you know. And, mm-hmm. and J.W. Brown, uh, the bass player and our cousin, J.W., said to Jerry when they were on a break, he said, why don't we do that song that you've been doing on the road that the people like so much? A whole lot of shaking going on. Because Jerry had learned that mm-hmm. from a DJ that was also a singer and performer, a guy called Johnny Little John. Mm-hmm. Jerry was in his band playing drums because yep. he had a piano player, and Jerry had gone there and said, I need a gig. He said, well, I don't need a piano player. He said, I need a drummer. Jerry said, okay, I'll be a drummer then. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jerry was playing drums, and, uh, and, and Johnny Little John would do that song exactly the way Jerry did it. You know, standing in one spot, wiggling around just a little bit, all of that. Mm-hmm. Jerry Exactly, and it was a huge hit. How, how did Jerry get along with the other guys, like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and, and guys like that? Oh, that you know, those guys loved each other. Yeah. And, and you know, it's like I see Little Richard on this film one time where he talks bad about Jerry. And he never meant that. That was just all part of the show. Right, right. Every, every time that we've worked with Little Richard, he's just been the sweetest, most mm-hmm. gracious man. I, I just loved it. Yep. And, and, of course, Chuck Berry, same thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I remember back in the year 2000 when I was recording with Van Morrison and I was in the U.K., Jerry and Chuck and Richard did this show together, and it was called The Legends. Mm-hmm. And they did it uh, near London. Right, and I remember I, that. I went to that, and I was backstage with all of them. I remember that. And I saw Jerry and Chuck just hugging each other and... And Chuck was telling me, now, Jerry, you got to be careful on these stairs. So they had these big tall stairs going up to the stage. So he walked with Jerry up the stairs. And uh, they, they just, they were just, they loved each other. Those mm. guys, they all did. You know, you know what's so funny about Chuck Berry? One of his biggest songs turns out to be My Ding-a-Ling. <laughs> oh, I know. You know that stuff, man. All those wonderful songs that Chuck Berry has hit why in the world. I know. I don't like because I'm a huge Chuck Berry fan. Yeah, I was a big... And he wrote so many wonderful songs. <laughs> Why that one? 
I don't know. I love Little Richard though. I, I he was you know he was so good. He was, Little oh, Richard. Such a sweet man, and he yeah. told me when I saw him in the year two thousand backstage. I said, Richard, you know how are you doing? And, and he said, Linda, I can hardly make it. I'm having trouble walking. Yeah. And he said, I'm in a lot of pain. Yeah. This is arthritis. Mm. It just broke my heart. Yeah. Yeah, I get a lot of a lot of greats on this show. I got Connie Francis. She's doing well. She's in Fort Lauderdale. That's where she lives now. She's, oh, I love her her song. She's she, doing good. She she's so great. I've had Petula Clark. I've had Dionne Warwick. Uh, you know, I love them all. You know, I love that's to me that's the best music ever. You know, back in the well, day. I'm honored that you will have me on here with all those big stars. Well, of course. I mean, you you've been. <laughs> You've been around a long time. Come on now. <laughs> well, I, I have been blessed. To still, I'm still here, and I praise God. I'm, I'm gonna stay here as long as I can because, you know, I'm having too much fun to leave. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of those moments that I think, well, this is heaven on earth. Yep, I can tell you're having fun. <laughs> Probably too much fun, right? <laughs> Here's your, here's your final question, and I ask everybody this question. I get some very interesting answers. Uh, if you had a Field of Dreams wish like the movie, um, to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who's that going to be? Somebody that I can collaborate with and, and perform with. Perform and with, it, do a it duet. Needs to be probably somebody besides my brother because oh, yeah. he's collaborating and performing with me anymore. But it can't be him, can it? it well, can't it, be can, somebody it, else. it can be. I mean, oh. you know, it can be. But well, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Robert Plant, and I absolutely love him. And he made those wonderful albums with Allison Krauss. That's right. Would, it would be a dream come true if I could do something with him. That's interesting. See, a lot of people probably wouldn't even think. Think that, you know? That, I would absolutely love that because I love Robert Plant and hmm. I did get to meet him, but I haven't got to sing with him. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an interesting answer. Very interesting but I answer. Would, I would really love that. Yeah, you know, Patula Clark told me Pink Floyd. Can you believe that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's something. You never know. You just never know. Well, that's just what popped into my head, and, you know, there's probably some others, too, that I could have said. Yeah. But that was, of course, we'd just been talking about Robert Plant, so that, that might have had a lot to do with it. But, you know, that, I think that would be wonderful if I could do that. Well, you know, Led Zeppelin will get back together again, and, and you'll you'll be there. You'll be part of the... <laughs> oh, I can see it now. The new Zeppelin. <laughs> Linda Gale Lewis on piano with Led Zeppelin. Oh yeah, we'd be rocking. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Linda, thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I want to say very special thanks to the great Billy James of Glass Onion PR for arranging this interview today with Linda Gale Lewis. And you know, please come to Florida. Darling, I will as soon as I can. I would really like to do that. And I appreciate you having me on your program. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. I want to say, everybody, Early Sides, 1963 to 73 by Linda Gale Lewis. Um, is that available now on Amazon? Because I, I thought I saw it on Amazon already. I mean, I, oh, yeah, people are ordering it already. They're already getting it, right? And, and also Wild 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 with Ro uh, Robbie Falks, that's available now on Amazon. And I want to mention your book, of course, The Devil, Me, and Jerry Lee, which I'm going to buy. Uh, great, great, great book. I've, I've read Thank all the so reviews. Much. It's, it, you know, you've already got that book under your belt. You know, a lot of people don't even do that. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun to do that, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having too much fun, I guess. I guess so. And, and your, your official website is uh, www.lglmusic.com. You're on music, uh, LGL Music Bandcamp. You're on Facebook. You're on Twitter. You're on Instagram. And you, your tour, um, let's see, July 29th, I think you start in Texas. Yes, darling. And you're going to be uh, in Denton, San Antonio, Houston. Um, you're going to be, let's see... Where else are you? You're going to be in Atlanta? New Orleans. New Orleans. You're all, and then the East Coast, like you said, you're going to be up in Owings, Maryland. My old, I, I'm originally from the, uh, the D.C. area, Owings, Sorry. Maryland. You're going to be in Long Island, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Philly. Yeah, you're going to be everywhere up there, up north. And you're going to fin finish, I think, in Austin, Texas on uh, 
Right, in Austin Town, unless you get some new dates. And hopefully you'll get some Florida dates uh, in the, in the near future. I hope so, and it's been so much fun talking to you today. Me too. I really, really appreciate it. Good luck with the new album and the tour, and uh, keep on rocking. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray. All right, Linda. Thank you. Okay, darling. Thank All right. you too. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.